For our COBT listeners and viewers, it's Maynard, Mike, Jeff, and Brett with something we thought was timely and interesting, uh, which is a discussion of the election and in particular uh, what the election might mean, the presidential election, what it might mean for energy policy. Um, we, we got lucky because it's hard to find a good sort of sober discussion of energy policy in today's world, but we got really lucky and connected with the team at Cornerstone Government Affairs. Uh, they're a Washington-based employee-owned consulting firm. Uh, they help uh, companies, organizations, uh, institutions of all kind, you know, manage through policy changes, potential policy changes. Just think about uh, the risks and opportunities that Washington uh, poses uh, for their business. And they wrote a great memo uh, on potential energy policy changes that we latched on to, have read and absorbed and found uh, to be really informative and a, and a good way to think through all these issues. We've got three principals here with us. We've got Jack Belcher, he's the principal uh, in the government affairs uh, area. He's worked a lot in energy in various organizations over his career. We've also got John Sandell. John's also a principal in government affairs. Uh, John was a, a staffer on the House Ways and Means Committee and is a tax uh, policy expert. And so taxes and, and how we treat taxes and how taxes uh, treat various investments, that's obviously always a huge issue. And we also have uh, Sarah Venuto. Uh, she's a principal uh, and legal uh, background, and she's also in the government affairs area. Um, she's got a fascinating background. Um, she was in the uh, working with the FERC uh, before she joined Cornerstone uh, at Duke Energy. Uh, she was in charge of public policy. So she's got a, you know, you can see we've got three great angles coming together here uh, to lead us through a conversation. So. Let me just stop and say, John, Sarah, Jack, we're delighted to have you guys. Really appreciate you coming on and helping us try to frame up this discussion. Thank you, Maynard. It's great to be here. All right. Thanks well, very much uh, for having us. No, we're excited. We're very excited. Well, Mike, what would you tell this crew, all of us, about what's happening in the markets today? It's kind of a little bit of a wild week uh, to start. Uh, I'd say Dow is down about a couple hundred points. And the reason it's down today is because JP Morgan came out today and basically you said that net interest income in uh, 2025 is going to probably be below where people are at, so numbers have to come down there. Goldman Sachs talked about trading, uh, trading revenues being, you know, being sloppy as well. So that's really kind of knocked the financials down a little bit today. Financials down about one percent. But sorry, the, Michael, what did you say? J.P. Morgan said what? Their net interest income is going to be okay. down uh, next year. They said it's way too high, and so numbers are going to be coming down for that company. And so. Financials, obviously being one of the bigger players of the financials is underperforming today. It's down about 1% the sector. Obviously energy is down about 2% today because crude oil is down quite substantially. And so we're gonna really kind of focus our discussion today on that uh, subject. You know, um, but before we get there, I just wanna talk about, you know, sort of the economic uh, events that are gonna be happening this week. As you've probably seen, you know, the you know 10 year bond is around, um, 3.65%, that's down 25, 30 basis points in the last week or so. You've got, a, you know, Monday the, on the 18th of, uh, of this month, you're gonna have an FOMC meeting. Most people expect they're gonna cut interest rates by a minimum of 25 basis points. But this week, tomorrow, you're gonna have CPI is gonna be reported. On Thursday, you're gonna have PPI reported. And so this is a very important week to decide how much they're going to cut, cut next week. If the numbers are not good, then it's going to be a minimum of 25. Some people think it's going to be as high as 50 basis points. The only thing I'd say is, you know, you know, be careful what you wish for because 50 basis points, if you get that, people are going to say, what's going on here? Why are they cutting so aggressively? What does that mean? And it kind of goes into the, my second point here, and that's just crude oil. Crude oil is under $66 uh, per barrel today. It's down about $15 over the last two months. That's over 20%. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking about this for, gosh, I don't know, the last five or six shows about why that is. This last week, it's uh, Libyan production coming back online. It's about a half a million barrels a day. Uh, you've been hearing about OPEC co cohesion, stuff of that nature. But today, what we had is basically, you know, OPEC, OPEC came out and basically uh, updated their demand estimates for 2024 and 2025, and they're modestly lower. So you have the combination of Chinese demand continuing almost every week. Someone's got a negative data point. That's come out. You have OPEC, you know, reducing, reducing demand. And it's just kind of like the knockout punch for crude oil today. So I think crude oil, if you look at it right now, it's massively oversold. I mean, if you look at the traders, 
everybody seems to be bearish right now. You know, the you know net short length is pretty, pretty uh, high at this point in time. So I think we're kind of getting towards the end of this thing. You never want to you know call the bottom, but it's, it's about the, it's, it's the bearishness that I've seen right now in this market is about uh, as much as I've seen in a while. You know, one last thing we want to really mention is and we're going to bring up a chart here to kind of give you an idea of how things have played out here. And this is just going to be the curve uh, for crude oil. This one is a uh, WTI. And if you look at this thing, the white line is what the curve looks like now. Uh, the blue line is what the curve looked like three months ago. The red line was six months ago and the purple line was about 12 months ago. And you can see the white line is pretty flattish from here all the way to out to 2035. The blue line was just three months ago. You can see how much backwardation that was. And you can see all the other months, uh, the backwardation. The interesting thing is when you look at 29 and beyond, it was pretty flattish for all of those curves out you know, there. So what I would say when you look at this is what has happened in the last three months. What has happened in the last three months is not a supply issue. It is a total demand issue. The market thinks demand's not gonna be there. That's why the curve is flattened out. And there's two implications here. Like I already said, I think traders are net, net shorted, you know, so they're very, very bearish right now. But the other thing is when you look at this curve is you know, a lot of people that are like sort of financial players like to play that market. They like to play the monthly role because it's a positive return. That positive return, as you can see, is gone now. And so that financial money is either gone or is going to be going out of crude oil here in the next couple months. And so I just think everything points to just a really, really bare setup. And, and it doesn't surprise me. That's why we're at $66 a barrel. The issue is everybody is negative right now. So I just think downside is limited from here. Uh, obviously, if you have some positive news, you'll have a big snapback. But the issue is, is I just don't think short traders are going to cover uh, their bets yet until they see something uh, change on the demand side of the equation. Supply can be dealt with. Demand is a lot tougher issue to deal with. And so until that gets resolved, we're probably going to have crude oil trading under $70 here for a while. So we just wanted to go throw that out. We thought this was an interesting chart. We had not shown this to you guys. And God, I don't think it's been a couple of years, to be quite honest with you. So we'll just leave it at that, man. Jeff, anything you'd add? You and I were commenting the curve is almost never flat. The only thing that um, to, to pile on Mike's commentary is you know, it's one thing, you know, the, the crude setup is really bearish. You know, you, you know the tendency you know, as a contrarian is to be opposite of that. But one of the things I worry about for energy equities over the medium term is just you have OPEC spare capacity offline. You, um, you have worries on the demand side. And, and normally to, to, to what you'd want to see to really attract meaningful equity dollars back in is some upside optionality. Now we could have a snapback if, if sentiment you know, you know, moves the other way, but in terms of like true long-term investors, they want to have these as good businesses generating good returns, but they'd also want upside optionality and with that crude spare capacity sitting at OPEC, it's, it's, it's just a headwind. Okay, that was great. Mike, one last question before we move on. Is most of the betting on a 25 or a 50 cut? It's probably, I would say a week, we can change ago was 25. It's probably somewhere in between 25 and 50 basis point now, like I said, several so economics. Kind of even. That, yeah, it's kind of an even. I think most people expect 50. The point, point is if you get 50, we saw that in 2001 and 2007. I don't want to basically remind you what happened back then, but 50 basis points would cause people to step back and say, why are they being so aggressive at this point in time? So just something to think about. Interesting. All right. Well, uh, Brad, any, any thoughts from you before we jump in with the Cornerstone team? Maynard, thanks so much for asking. I think the only thing that I would uh, bring up today is, you know, in a, in a discussion that we're going to have around energy policy and government policy, especially in nuclear space, it's sometimes really hard to find the tangibles in action around some of this policy, as I said, especially in the nuclear space. And so I'd highlight last week that we saw an announcement in Tennessee uh, with Arano pledging to build a multi-billion dollar uranium enrichment facility, which would be the first new domestic enrichment facility in this country in decades, supports the massive needs around the uranium supply chain and the challenges of, um, excuse me, excluding Russia from that act, from those activities. Um, and builds on the billions of dollars of federal support and state support in Tennessee that is attracting this sort of attention, not just in the uranium supply chain, but in nuclear technology more broadly at te in Tennessee. So to see a French company 
be leveraging and utilizing this funding to build such a large investment in a to excuse me make such a large investment to build a new facility uh, really shows how, what this financial drivers around the policies that um, the government has enacted for nuclear and uranium supply chain. And it's happening much faster than some of the other activities we're seeing in the nuclear space. Awesome. Well, again, uh, Jack, John, Sarah, we're delighted to, to have you guys. And it's a, it's a, it's a tough subject to uh, tackle because it's complicated and it means we have to talk about what no one wants to talk about, which is the election. Um, but seriously, Jack, maybe one place to start is just a little background on uh, Cornerstone, sure. the team, the firm, you know, how you guys approach these types of things. It's, it's fascinating. Sure. No. Thank you, Maynard. Um, so Cornerstone has been around since 2002. Uh, we started out as a government relations firm based in Washington, D.C. Our focus in the beginning was mostly on appropriations, and we still have a, a very strong uh, appropriations practice. We grew over the years um, to add state offices to our practice and, and different areas in our, in our practice. Um, we now have 180 employees uh, in 16 locations around the country. So we operate not only in Washington, but in different states. We provide services on government relations, but also on public affairs communications. Uh, we have a, an advisory services team that advises clients on things like uh, DEI, sustainability, um, help companies with decarbonization strategies. So we've grown over the years um, and we're now the, uh, what, the largest independent uh, government relations firm, lobby firm in Washington. Um, we're unique in that we have these offices. Meaning independent that's all Independent that we're not a law firm. Okay, and, okay. And, and or owned by a foreign parent or or anything like that. We're one hundred percent employee owned um, and and independent in the sense that that we are yeah self owned and independent. <laughs> you mentioned that we're an ESOP. We think that's a very important part of our culture. Um, that we, agree. we we all we all right we we all have an interest in everyone being successful in the firm. So we think that's been an important reason that we've grown so much. And um, our practices across the spectrum uh, of all kinds of, of industries, um, transportation, uh, agriculture, education, healthcare, uh, financial services. So we're in a lot of different places. Mm -hmm. We're all part of the energy team. Um, our energy team, we have clients across the spectrum, upstream, downstream, midstream, renewables. We work with financial service companies that work in the energy space. So, so we're kind of across the spectrum integrated in the energy space. And um, we have everything from Fortune 500 companies, um, you know, large companies to startups. So uh, we have a diverse group of, of clients that we represent. And uh, energy, how, how, how important is energy? I assume maybe your energy practice has grown a lot or gotten a lot more attention in the last few years, but maybe talk about that. We have. Um, our firm has grown a lot in, in the last few years, and in particular in, our, in the energy space. Um, our, you know, our clients have all kinds of different interests. Some clients we work with, um, John will work on tax issues. We, the IRA, um, with all of the, the money that's being distributed on a, that, we advise clients in that area. That's an area that's grown. The energy transition, a, a number of our clients are very interested in what's going on in the energy transition. We manage some coalitions of different interests, uh, common interests in energy. Um, so we have um, a real variety, yes, and it's grown significantly um, in the last, I would say, five, six years. And this is just kind of a curiosity because we'll see a lot of companies that have a government relations person. Does your, do your clients tend to have that kind of capacity and they're seeking more, or is it the or is it clients that for some reason have less of that and need outside help? Is there a pattern to your clients? It's both. Uh, we have some clients that have, uh, you know, the larger clients especially, they'll, they may have an, an office in Washington or office mm -hmm. in the States, but we're, we're an addition to their team and we provide capabilities and relationships that, that they don't have in house. Um, we have, you know, expertise in areas that they may not have. Um, but we have smaller clients that have, 
no one in that space. So we really serve as their government mm -hmm. relations team, whether it's at the federal level, state level, or both. And is that, you know, your, your bio, as I mentioned, I'm up front, you guys, all three of you done really impressive things, but is it typical of a cornerstone person that they worked in government in some way, shape, or form before joining cornerstone? A, a large number of our, I would say the majority of our people have worked mm -hmm. in, in either federal government, state government, um, maybe they've worked in government affairs somewhere else, whether mm -hmm. it's in a company or for another firm. Um, and, and we're bipartisan, split right down the middle. We've got Republicans, Democrats, we're bicameral, meaning we've got people that come from the House, from the Senate, mm -hmm. maybe they served in one of the departments in the administration, um, and folks that we've got in, in our organization that work in the private sector as well. Well, it's, it's fascinating, and it's great to, to meet you guys, and it's been fun over the last not sure when we first started getting some of your uh, materials and such, but uh, it's been great reading and we've enjoyed it. Well, I, I read your materials and I, and I, I, I kind of was a setup. Your, I, I was begging you to say you liked our stuff. Uh, I, I watch your podcast. That's fine. Um, and I watch COBT just every week. So. Awesome. Well, um, so when we let's jump into energy policy and um, you guys, the, the memos laid out really well. You've got kind of I don't know, 20-ish sections where you, you know, talk about very specific things. One overhang to the whole thing is uh, Chevron deference. And that's just, you know, kind of rock the boat in, in so, so many ways. I know that's a meaty place to start, and you've got another uh, memo that you put out just on that. But well, can we pause on that and, and have you guys talk about its significance and just that lens uh, sure. for all this stuff? I'm I'm happy to jump off, uh, uh, Jack, and 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 look to anything Sarah to, uh, contribute, and, and you as well. I mean, I, I actually think it's a great place to start um, because it is something that, at least in my view, is being sort of undercovered, um, you know, by the media, perhaps not especially appreciated, um, even even in D.C. at uh, D.C. that's that's very focused on these upcoming elections. Um, this, um, you know, this Supreme Court decision in Loper Bright versus Raimondo uh, that came down um, in, in early July, overturning, you know, 40 years of established precedent um, in what was called, you know, Chevron deference, uh, you know, a set of Supreme Court rules um, around, uh, you know, deference to agency determinations if they were kind of reasonable. And this, this um, Sarah and I are both uh, lawyers by training and, and, and um, you know, although we don't practice law at Cornerstone, um, we're, you know, we're consultants. Um, but, but all that is to say, I mean, I think we have, we have some history kind of from way back in time, learning the, learning some of the legal side of this stuff and kind of the Folks may be aware of kind of the Chevron two-step analysis is a, a, a sort of famous way they, they teach it. Um, I think in our view, it's it's difficult to overstate the significance and importance um, and reverberations uh, of this decision, which, um, you know, really ought to cause agencies and stakeholders and policymakers, uh, you know, in Congress and, and throughout the administration to readjust their expectations about how courts may be looking at agency rulemakings relative to you know, really tight, well-developed legislative statutory law. And on the one hand, really likely uh, weakening uh, creative or, or what, what some, especially some, some conservative uh, elected officials might, uh, might criticize as overly creative uh, regulatory activity while um, really emphasizing and strengthening the importance of very particular, uh, very specific, very detailed uh, legislative policy development, statutory policy development, wherever that's possible. Um, and um, I think we're in the very early stages of even beginning to understand kind of what this means as we as we approach the fall and next year, we may see lower courts begin to try and, and apply this, this decision um, in new ways and, and evaluate maybe even existing uh, longstanding agency rulemakings in, in a variety of ways uh, that are new. And, and I, I think it's just it's likely to be a moving target that evolves over many years, uh, but but really hard, in my view, to overstate uh, the effects. But I, 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 I'm curious what Sarah would add to all that. Yeah, admittedly, I think when the decision came down in, in the Loper case, John and I in our put our legal hats on momentarily. We did not, we cannot obviously advise on the legal implications for our client, but the way that we have been thinking about it is really what does this do to your presence in Washington as a corporation or a trade association for that matter? How do you start to think about how to talk to Congress now in particular? 
Um, and, and what it really comes down to is a tug of war is being created and we may not realize the full impacts is, as John said, but the courts, right? And some are arguing or supplanting their technical expertise on things like, I don't know, the the mating patterns of the North Atlantic salmon, right, in a place where they shouldn't be doing that because they are determining things that they don't necessarily have the resources expertise to do. On the flip side of that, you would then say, well, then Congress needs to be more specific when it legislates. Well, the thing about Congress is John and I worked in Congress. John worked in the House and I worked in the Senate, and we've both dealt with agencies, Um and we know both sides of this coin. Congress does not have the resources. There's not a biologist, a fish biologist sitting up there that can sit and advise me as a staff director on the implications of a hydropower licensing reform. That's what the agencies are for, right? And so it's created this sort of weird feedback loop in terms of how are we going to legislate going forward? Arguably, um, the legislative branch will need more appropriations. Um, which is sort of ironic since a lot of this is because the argument, the more conservative leaning argument is government got too big. The administrative state got too big by virtue of Chevron. Um, so it really becomes incumbent upon all of us as um, sort of informal advisors to legislators who advocate for certain policies or against certain policies to bring our A game with technical expertise specificity and make sure that when they are legislating and it comes down to votes and amendments, um, it will withstand a, a stronger legal threshold and be more legal do legally durable than we've gotten used to. Uh, I think the challenging and scary part for me about that is what's going to get done. A lot of times, whether or not we realize it as aids to legislators, to policymakers, we kind of end up with the lowest common denominator policy because it's generic enough that you can get a Democrat and a Republican with deeply held beliefs on that, understanding that there's more work to be done. That dynamic um, is, is going to be tested. So I'll stop there. You know, and I, I should have mentioned, Sarah, in the lead in, you worked in Joe Manchin's office. Uh, Joe's obviously had a, a great influence and role in, in energy policy over the years. So does this, uh, one, one question as you were talking there about this, can, uh, can Congress, this will be an overly simplistic question, can Congress or a specific committee, could you turn to the agencies and say, okay, on this salmon mating question, <laughs> give us the specifics as you see it, we'll, we'll review it, and then if we believe that's the way it should be enforceable, put it into the legislation. Can, can Congress work with the agencies in, in that kind of way? Yeah, I think so. I think Congress does now. Um, a, a member of Congress writing a bill can request technical assistance from an agency, certainly. Um, every agency is made up of career staff and political staff. And um, making sure that the conversation at the agency and with the agency is holistic um, is going to be important to ensuring that the specificity is um, based in sound science, data, et cetera. There is a lot of that interaction. Uh, it's not always... It depends on the party lineup and who's asking and right, but but the politicals are there with a lot of with a lot of I mean the the career folks are there with a lot of knowledge you know over the years and that's very valuable. Um, when I was on the Natural Resources Committee staff, I, was, I had what we call detailees from one from BLM and one from the Minerals Management Service, which is is no longer, but they were there for a year or so to help advise on some of these policy areas. So. So what, what this came up, uh, Jack, as we were uh, coercing you guys, convincing you to come on the show, um, which is that uh, we're going to nose into energy policy. I think the number is something like a new administration has about 3,000 appointments Washington-wide. Is that is that fair to characterize it like that? I, I think that's about right, 3,000. Uh, yeah. About 3,500. Because it's so, it's so interesting, um, you know, you can have a policy, you can have a vision, you can tell constituents this is where you're headed, but those 3,500 people and how they, and now this gets to Chevron, but how they see things and how they approach their job and what their philosophy is, that, that's, that's pretty relevant. Absolutely. And, you know, you've got people that come in with different levels of understanding of the subject matter mm -hmm. and they their job is to work with the staff that's there, um, the career people that are technically 
savvy, have been working on this stuff for years, and it's the interaction, how that all works. It's, uh, it's kind of a complicated process. Well, it's a, it's a fascinating dynamic to the election because in some ways they forgive the analogy. I know you're a Texas guy, Jack, so congrats on the win Saturday. Oh, thank but you. if the, the coaching analogy is sort of like you have a new coach, but the coach is going to appoint 3,500 assistants, and those 3,500 are going to be really relevant to how the team does. Absolutely, and it's a big, you know, there's a change you know, that comes yeah. when a new administration comes in. What, what is it like, you guys have seen this for so many years, when you do get a change, how crazy, disruptive, just nutty is it for you as you watch? You're trying to advise clients if, if there is a change, whenever there's a change, you've seen it before. Is that a really unwieldy and just difficult time? Is it like tax season for an accounting firm? I mean, it, it, it's, it sounds awful. <laughs> no, like like any system, right? I mean, it, it, it's it's busy, it's dynamic. There are things about it that are unpredictable, and it, it requires you know attention and work and and forethought and 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 active thought as it's happening. I mean, but oftentimes, I mean, you know, this this ecosystem of policymakers and and, and professional staff and aides that work in agencies and on Congress, um, you know, a lot of these people sort of cross pollinate. Right. New administrations often staff from Congress. Um, they staff from prior administrations. Um, they staff from kind of the, the think tank universe um, and, and sort of from, from, from known quantities often. Uh, and it takes time uh, for a new administration to scale up. Um, you know, and in the last few years, I think we've seen sort of both parties uh, do that, uh, scale up new administrations um, and, and kind of handle a, a partisan shift. Um, and, and so there, I mean, there absolutely is, is a lot to it. And I, I mean, certainly no, no room to dispute your, your characterization manner that it'll have an enormous influence on policymaking from an agency perspective. Um, but really, I mean, back, back to the Chevron question too, right? This the interaction between Congress and an administration, um, you know, that, that is a really important part of the dynamic as well. And, um, you know, how, how the house and Senate go in these upcoming elections, are likewise going to have just a, a huge impact um, on policymaking in this and 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 other spaces, and sort of important not to discount that as well. But yeah, Sarah, what would you say? Well, John is always the calmer of the two of us, and <laughs> um, <laughs> having come from this current administration, I can tell you it can be a lot. It can um, the selection process for an appointee, the nominations process is um, often an all hands on deck uh, effort. Uh, before you even get to that place, you've got lists that are being made, but you're also sending staff um, to be the landing team to an agency, right? The go-between uh, for the White House um, and the agency, the careers who are sort of waiting there, um, ready for the new administration's politicals, but also under statutory directive to continue the work of the agency, right? Mm -hmm. um, just because the White House flips doesn't mean the NAC gas act stops, Right. Stops being a law and, and the, the responsibilities associated with that law um, under the fiat of FERC have to move forward. That said, appointees matter because at the end of the day, that's where the buck stops and that's where the decision making happens. And that's where members, uh, excuse me, um, cabinet level secretaries, deputies are held accountable. Um, and so that process is laborious. It's intense. It takes up a lot of time for administration. And whether you're going from a DEM to a DEM, an R to a D or a D to an R administration, there's going to be lag, right? Mm -hmm. Because there is a decision-making role for politicals in many corners of the government, not every single corner, but in many corners of the government um, that is given, is deferred to that political appointee. And, and therefore, the transition can be um, a little chaotic. Uh, at Cornerstone, we have a lot of former staff directors, chiefs, appointees ourselves, so we understand that and are pretty good at gathering intel and figuring out where to go when. Um, and to use like the only sports analogy I know, skate to where the puck is going. Um, and and so that's that's my take on it. But John, like I said, is much more zen than I am. So no, it's well, it's fascinating for people who who don't live in government and work around it every day. It's it's fascinating to think about that kind of rotation. It's interesting, too, because you've got career people, senior career people, who will um, play an acting role until the, until the appointees come in. And so they have, to, they, they have to kind of be a little bit of a chameleon because they've, they're serving different administrations. They're, they're, they're technical experts uh, in, mm -hmm. their, in their field. So they have to put on a different hat, rise up for a few months, and serve as the acting 
you know, deputy secretary or what, what, whatever the level cap, the level position is, and until they're, you know, someone is appointed, goes through the process and, and takes that position. Very interesting. Well, let me jump in and, and then I'm going to turn to Mike and Jeff and Brett for their questions too. I'll do the kind of the first energy policy, you know, specific question, which I think one way to ask it, I was thinking about all the things you cover in your memo. You hit on transmission and permitting and federal lands and, um, you know, EVs and minerals and, you know, just all the various things uh, that will come up. As you think about the, uh, the biggest issues or the starkest difference, or maybe the question you're getting the most from your clients, what, what, is, the, what is the top of the, like the, the, the thing that's drawing the most attention when you have these conversations about how energy policy might be different under, under these two potential administrations? I think you've asked two questions and I think that with respect to the, the inquiry about what our clients are asking IRA, is a big one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't um, true across the board, but a lot of our clients have expanded or established a DC presence, whether putting their own boots on the ground, hiring firms like ours, hiring public affairs firms in DC in the wake of the bipartisan infrastructure law, the Inflation Reduction Act, the Chips and Science Act. Um, and it's an extraordinary amount of government spend. 1.6 trillion between the tax policy and the direct funding. And a lot of it still hasn't gone out the door. And even when it does go out the door, the question remains, how is that project, that infrastructure um, site, that facility, that semiconductor fab, how is it going? How are we doing in the global market based on these three new additions, right? There have been an extraordinary amount of clean energy jobs added. There has been an extraordinary amount of infrastructure um, announced or underway by virtue of these uh, pieces of legislation plus the American Rescue Plan, right? Um, and so when you think about all that, it's hard to, to think about it as a short-term bill that's just a 10-year spend bill specific to the IRA because the fact of the matter is we are discovering that there are additional policies that are necessary to continue to make us competitive in what is presumably the clean energy transition or the reshoring of manufacturing, the manufacturing renaissance. And those are really the two underlying goals of those three, four bills, right? Make the U.S. competitive again as a manufacturing nation and then continue the clean energy transition. And so when we think about this, the sort of um, presence of startups, whether they're early stage, mid stage, late stage, they're asking themselves these questions as they're working with the agency on their grant application or getting their, you know, award negotiated, getting the dollars out the door. Um, that those are not going to go away. And I, and I know I might be leading into a conversation that John and I have had many, many times about the fate of the IRA under either administration. But, um, and we can certainly go into that further. But I would also say that, you know, permitting is something that I think a lot of people are thinking about. I think a lot of people are hopeful that we can find the right mix of policy ideas, put them in a bill, get it across the finish line, and that will resolve our permitting issues. Um, and I'm going to sound a little bit partisan here, so forgive me, but I also think this is about expertise. It's about human capital. It's about ensuring that even once we do streamline permitting and we reform the judicial approach to litigation around infrastructure projects, we are also ensuring that agencies have the resources to process a, a sort of unprecedented amount of permits of new infrastructure, of um, semiconductor fabs that are receiving federal dollars. And so I think a lot about permitting. Um, I'm very optimistic about the permitting bill that Senators Manchin and Barrasso put out. It is a great mix of priorities from both sides. Um, politics will be a, will play a big role in whether or not it gets across the finish line. And if it does not this year, it's going to be a conversation next year. Um, but the one thing that I think is permeating a lot of the discussions we're having, whether we're talking about um, manufacturing of construction equipment, whether we're talking about the production of batteries, EVs, um, the build out of transmission, we are talking a lot about competition with China. 
And it is an extraordinary layering of the conversation that permeates the Republican side and the Democratic side, the House and the chamber. And it is one that I don't think is going to go away, no matter who's in the White House next year. Let me add to that uh, with highlighting where I, I think we agree. And um, in, in kind of our, our introductions, I don't, I don't know if uh, we said it explicitly, um, while my wonderful colleague's uh, background uh, is, is with uh, Democratic politicians, um, mine is with working for a Republican chairman um, of, of the Ways and Means Committee. So we do have a, a bipartisan uh, perspective here. I, I agree with Sarah entirely that, um, you know, China competition is a lens through which a lot of members and policymakers um, are looking at, you know, the current Congress, the upcoming Congress. That's not going away anytime soon. Um, you know, real scrutiny um, on China's involvement uh, in our energy supply chains and our supply chains in general and our energy markets, um, th that's likely to continue. I mean, we're seeing a bill um, likely on the floor of the House of Representatives this very week um, that would reevaluate, reassess, uh, you know, how uh, Chinese supply chain components are treated with respect to the Section 30D electric vehicle credit. Um, permitting, likewise, you know, is a space for, for real opportunity for bipartisan compromise and something, uh, you know, a lot of our clients are really focused on as we approach the end of the year. Um, a place where, as Sarah alluded to, I think we, we may see some real partisan contrast, though, is the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and in particular, the tax and incentive policies um, enacted by that bill, um, of which Republicans have been very critical, um, you know, for, for uh, now the you know, couple years since, since the enactment of that bill. And I, I mean, I do think there's a spectrum, right? Um, uh, my perception is, you know, that criticism is the most acute uh, when it comes to things like the electric vehicle credit. Um, and, you know, maybe uh, a little less severe when it comes to policies that have been, you know, knocking around in one form or another for a, a much longer period of time or that were enacted by, you know, bipartisan legislation. Um, you think, you know, something like uh, the 45Q carbon capture and sequestration uh, incentive regime, which, um, you know, it existed for a long time and the IRA made changes to it, modified it. Um, you know, and there's been a lot of historical bipartisan support for that policy. And so you sort of look at, at, at those two ends of the spectrum and a lot with respect to everything in between may rest on how things fall in the election, certainly in the presidential and in, in, in both bodies in Congress as well. And the more sort of Republican um, control and more Republican majorities that, that you see, sort of the more um, skepticism and, and criticism and revisiting of a broader universe of IRA policies you, you may end up seeing. Um, and and um, Sarah alluded to the, the revenue numbers there. I think um, Congressional scorekeepers at CBO and JCT uh, have revised their estimates of IRA uh, fiscal incentives. This is not something that's been sort of widely discussed in a lot of places, but um, those numbers have gone up considerably. What was you know close to 300 billion, um, you know, at the time of enactment in the summer of 2022, according to the more recent public estimates um, from kind of this this past year, we're looking at closer to 700 billion dollars um, uh, with respect to those incentives. Um, I think that, you know, that offset mix or that perspective offset mix creates a lot of potential for Republican policymakers who are looking uh, next year at the expiration of more than $4 trillion in tax policy from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, um, from the 2020 omnibus, from, from sort of other, other tax policy uh, sources. Um, and there's just this much broader debate that includes energy, but, but a lot of other things as well, general tax policy that, that affects energy companies tax policy affecting individuals and businesses of all kinds. And, and, and that, that real uh, macro sort of tax and fiscal policy debate that's likely to kick up next year, um, you know, bleeds into all this, right? Um, and so, you know, my, my suggestion would be that there is some real risk with respect uh, to a number of IRA policies, you know, in the context of a good night for Republicans in November. Um, you know, but a lot rests on, you know, are we living in a divided government environment or a, a, a more, uh, you know, Republican sweep type environment? Um, and, and the risk will, will vary accordingly, uh, I think. Yeah, I mean, there's a thousand different questions I want to ask, but uh, maybe I'll just ask, um, we've had a, a Trump presidency, we saw the staff that he put in place. You know, we, I guess you know, my question is, is you have the Biden staff. What does the staff look like under a new, you know, uh, Harris administration? What does it look like in Trump? Did he learn any? Le how would how how different could those two be from what we see right now, from what we saw at the in the uh, Trump first term? 
Well, so at the outset, I guess I would say, you know, forecasting individual appointments or specific people obviously is very, very difficult at the stage, I think, for, for either party. Um, I think to, to pick up one of your specific questions, I, I think it's absolutely true that, that uh, former President Trump uh, and his team, his sort of extended team, a lot of which, uh, you know, similar people still in that orbit, um, learned a ton from the first uh, four years of their administration, as any president and team would. And I think there's a wide expectation, um, you know, that I share that, that they would absolutely hit the ground running in the event uh, they succeed in winning a second term, um, you know, and have uh, sort of a, a really thoughtful, well-planned out transition, which, you know, has has been underway, is widely publicized, um, you know, and, and be thinking uh, in a little bit more of a, a forward leading way about, you know, filling those those senior key appointees early on. Um, you know, it's been widely publicized that, it, you know, at the end of his administration and, and, you know, perhaps at the beginning of a second administration, he would look to curtail um, the, the civil service a little bit, um, that kind of schedule F discussion that's um, that's out there. Certainly, I think I think that would be a, a big part of this conversation as well, downsizing the federal bureaucracy. Um, but I, I think, you know, we absolutely could anticipate seeing kind of professional folks from from the last administration, um, you know, considering a return, uh, you could see kind of the, the conservative think tank community and, and and professional community, the business community, um, and, and, and kind of, um, you know, American uh, stakeholder universe, everything from sort of the, the, the Wall Street universe, which famously, you know, fed some, some senior treasury appointees, including Secretary Mnuchin, um, who, you know, I and others might argue was, you know, an, an incredibly successful um, Trump one cabinet appointee. Um, so that's sort of a fertile natural ground to look for, for key appointments. Um, but I think there's been a lot of, of forward planning and forward looking um, in the in, in that space um, this time around. I, I certainly would defer to, to Sarah to think about uh, how, you know, how the Harris team is thinking about things. Yeah, I would I would echo what John said. It's a little bit too early to start naming names. Um, but, you know, Vice President Harris has served in this administration and um, has seen um, a lot of really strong cabinet secretaries, a lot of really strong staff, uh, whether or not you agree, agree with their policy or their ideology. Um, and I think the scorecard down the road will show that the Biden administration got a lot done. There were some big legislative achievements. Um, so I, I think we will see a mix of, sorry, the lights in my office just went out. Um, but what matters is what I'm saying. Um, the, I think you'll see a mix of folks from, the Biden administration, the Obama administration, this administration, the current administration had a lot of Senate staff. I anticipate Vice President Harris, if she were successful in her presidential bid, would bring back some of her senior advisors that had previously served. Um, I will also say that in the energy space, and you'll hear this tonight during the presidential debate, um, you know, there is this this sort of balance that the vice president is is seeking to strike on energy policy as she starts to reveal more of what she's going to be doing um, that I think the Biden administration has also been working at. And it's how do we balance the clean energy efforts, messaging, funding with the um, desire of unions, a traditionally democratic um, stronghold of support to build right, to build major infrastructure projects and to benefit from the job that our created from that. And so I think that when we look at the energy messaging um, that we are seeing from the Harris campaign, it is a balance. And and she has not shied away from the fact that oil and gas production is at an all-time high in the United States. Um, that was taking up uh, in, in prior administrations, certainly, but that's not something that hasn't been stated or or sort of um, and hidden in in the um, in the messaging that we've seen to date. So I think that's something to keep in mind as you think about who's going to fill the number one spots at agencies, um, the head of CEQ at the White House, EPA, Interior, Energy, Commerce is increasingly important to energy stakeholders as well. So hope that's helpful. I think I'll, I'll stay with a, a question for Sarah, just given your recent experience at FERC. Because I think about, you know, the power markets and electricity markets feels like a tricky one for both administrations. We're going to an environment where demand is growing. Um, we're kind of st starting to get generation short, which inherently means that for voters, it's probably more expensive four or five years from now for their power. 
So I, I, maybe you guys just contrast what, how you think the administrations would approach kind of power policy. I know underlying in that permitting is, is really critical and transmission is really critical, but maybe differentiate you know, how you'd see the two administrations kind of attacking that question, which inherently is gonna be a hot button if it's costing more for the voters. Yeah, I can jump here. I'd love I'd love to hear Jack's take. The great thing about the work that we do is, um, and John reminds me of this all the time, is we're an all of the above firm. We work for um, uh, oil and gas clients. We work for critical minerals clients. We work for renewables clients. Um, because at the end of the day, uh, all of these sources of energy are going to play a role. To your point about the electricity markets and the power markets, that does seem to be where the energy prices are high, argument is going to stick more. Right, it, particularly in the in the environment that um, uh, you all were describing earlier around crude, I think um, that there is going to be a push for increased production on federal lands in a Trump administration, um, and I think it will primarily focus on oil and gas production. Um, Conversely, I could see the Harris administration continuing forward with the offshore wind goal that the Biden administration set forth. They just hit their 50 percent mark in terms of announcements for offshore wind um, projects. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but I also I don't want to get into this space where one administration is just for renewables and another administration is just about oil and gas and nuclear and like your more traditional baseload resources, because I think that's really overstating the role that the federal government has to play here. Um, these markets have been evolving for some time towards a more diverse power, let's just take the power sector, a more diverse power sector, right? Um, to your point, uh, there is this dynamic that is starting to percolate and we're hearing it more and more on both sides of the aisle, which is we want to do more semiconductor manufacturing here. We're going to be using AI. It's going to be a part of our lives. We're figuring out how to do that in a safe and responsible way, but it's hard to put that genie back in the bottle. We are going to be doing more with supercomputing. Um, and the list goes on, right? Crypto mining. These are huge power consuming clients and companies and resources. So as we're pushing towards more intermittent generation on the grid, and we are seeing a manufacturing renaissance that is in some ways anchored in industries that are huge power consumers. Those are questions that we, these, whatever administration comes forward is going to have to grapple with. And I think we'd be fooling ourselves to think that we don't need all resources, right? Um, with respect to FERC specifically, I will say it is an independent agency. It is an e economic regulator and there's often a tug of war around ideology, but that's why it's a five member commission. Right. And, and that's how they come to decisions still. And I personally, as, a, as an alum of that agency, um, I'm very excited that there is a five member commission now heading into this next year um, and, and a healthy debate is happening at the commission around a lot of issues. I would say you're hearing from the Trump campaign more and more about the need for base load generation. You're hearing it from from everywhere, really. But but, you know, there's obviously more of an emphasis on fossil energy, traditional energy coming from that campaign, this whole theme of, of energy dominance. Sarah mentioned federal lands. I think that's an area where um, Trump is going to be focusing on, you know, what happened in the last administration with the pause offshore um, and the number of lease sales in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, I think you'll see a push um, from him for, for more lease sales, less stringent lease stipulations, um, less, uh, you know, terms where, you know, lower royalties and things like that, both onshore and offshore. So I think you're going to see, you know, a, a real push um, from the administration on that. And then permitting, um, big theme here, you know, how do we, how do we permit um, these things in a way where we can get projects done? Um, there's an increased awareness that with AI and, and just the demand surge we're seeing that we're going to have to to, to do something about that and policy is going to have to reflect that from the Trump administration. I think you're going to see, you know, a real push for let's build more uh, baseload generation, whether that's nuclear, whether that's gas, you know, even, even coal, um, that that's going to be where more of the focus is. And I, and I think in terms of offshore wind, you know, I think um, over, you know, the, the administration is going to be supportive of all things, but Certainly, the candidate has said things about, you know, the, the wind industry that has people in that 
that sector a bit nervous. Can, can I just, the, the three of you, is it um, in the policy circles in the world that you live in, in Washington, is the um, increasing cost of power to, you know, citizens all over the country, is, is that is that on everybody's radar kind of in the same way that the price of gasoline is? or Because I think we end up thinking down here that it is, but we don't we don't know how Washington thinks about it. Washington's not a monolith, right? Um, you have, you know, 535 elected officials in Congress. You have thousands of, of appointees, um, you know, in, in the agencies. Um, you have, you know, uh, senior executive branch officials. You know, the folks uh, focused on higher education may not be thinking about um, utility and energy prices in the way that, that the folks, uh, Sarah's former colleagues at FERC are. And, but all of which is to say, I mean, I, I think I'd suggest it's a, it's a spectrum, right? And, and absolutely there are members for whom high energy costs and rising energy costs are a, a key factor or something they're worried about looking toward next year. Um, and then there are some, you know, some policymakers who are relatively less, maybe less focused on it and more focused on other priorities. Because it's really interesting if you say $4 a gallon, everybody gets that. But if you say 40 cents a kilowatt, no, yeah. nobody, I mean, maybe some people get that. Or, you know, it's just, it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, I think you're, you, you hit a good point because, I mean, it is a regional thing too, right? There's a pretty... Uh, there's a there's a difference between you know regions, but but you're right. People focus more on their on their how much it costs to fill up their car than they than they do a lot of times on on their electricity. Well, but I think that was the world we used to be in. The world we're going into now is electricity. It's electricity demand. We haven't had electricity demand grow in 20 years. It's going to grow substantially. So now, I would say that being in PJM with prices going up substantially, the risk of you know, brownouts and blackouts probably increasing. That's going to get the ear of congressmen pretty darn quickly. Price is going to get the ear pretty darn quickly. So I think that that's going to be a big issue that they're going to have to address for sure. Let's jump to that island of tranquility where Republicans and Democrats seem to agree, and that's nuclear. Uh, Brett, what, what would you tell us we ought to talk about in, in nuclear? Well, I mean, I think uh, th this has been a super fascinating, uh, you know, conversation, and I you know, apologize to, you know, jump in with, you know, rockier waters than um, Maynard may characterize. But, you know, as we were just- Yeah, Brett, you missed your cue. You're supposed to do something really smooth and fun. <laughs> you know how I like the surprise. Um, you know, as, you, as, as Jack was just alluding to, and as Maynard alluded to, the dialogues around baseload power and nuclear generation in both um, sort of camps seem to be mostly aligned and aligned in a way that is not similar in a lot of other policy areas. But in order to support nuclear or baseload power generation growth of any kind in this country, um, one of the you know mechanisms that the federal government has established is, and that we've engaged with a lot, is the loan program office. And we've seen you know, some discussions recently I, from my old life, I've had, you know, from my old environmental and NGO life, I've had numerous sort of colleagues, you know, present policy recommendations and draft bills, all looking at reappropriating and changing around LPO financing and the amount of money that the LPO has available for future projects. So how should we think about, and I know that the, the available funding, a lot of which was just made available, has uh, sunset clauses that are, you know, just a couple of years away. So they, that funding has to be allocated quickly soon anyways. But how should we think about the risk here for companies and groups thinking about big projects that might want to pursue uh, LPO financing and funding? Is this, is this an opportunity to jump on it fast or are, is this funding potentially at risk? Or is that just, you know, the regular state of play in D.C.? So it's a it's a great question. I'll say this about DOE if and, and the loan program office. One, it's definitely got new life um, breathed into it in the past couple of years since the passage of these these legislative bills that we've been talking about. Um, two, it is not a technical risk taking body. It is a financial risk taking body. Um, when Vogel went online this year, we saw some headlines pop up that I think surprised a lot of us, which was advanced nuclear, 
small modular reactors. Oh, back to the big, right? Back to the big guys. Let's start building big nuclear plants again. So, so there's a lot of um, different points of view in terms of how we are going to move forward in the nuclear industry. Agree with you, Brett. It is bipartisan. Um, and there are a lot of folks on both sides of the aisle that see the value. Um, in terms of the loan program office itself, it is a statutory product of Title um, 17. No, nope, I always get this wrong. Thank you. I got the right number? Yes, thank you. Um, but it doesn't actually score. And, and John spends a lot of time thinking about how the Congressional Budget Office scores things. This office scores very low because it is loan authority, right? These dollars aren't necessarily going to go out the door. And a lot of it is not a loan. It is a loan guarantee. So I think that it would take a, a buy, a, well, a either unified government or a very interesting bipartisan effort to overcome the existence of the LPO in some real capacity. It is a creature of statute at the end of the day, right? Um, prioritization of projects could change whether it's a Dem administration or Republican administration. LPO now looks at critical mineral projects, right? But they are about deploying. It's not an R&D office. So I, I would say think about it that way um, and, and sort of watch closely what you see the messaging around DOE's agenda um, is going to be either a Harris administration or Trump administration. LPO could track that in terms of prioritization of certain types of projects. And I think, you know, there's there's um, a lot of talk about what a Trump administration might do with the IRA and the loan program office. Well, I think it's important to know that 18 Republicans sent a letter uh, to the speaker in the House, uh, 18 representatives saying, do not, you know, touch this. This is too important to our districts, to mm. our, the economy. And, you know, even the speaker himself in Louisiana, all the carbon capture and storage activity that's going on there. So I think, you know, Congress is it, one, I think in, in, a, in a Trump administration, you know, there are going to be a lot of influences from the energy industry, a lot of companies that have made investments already based on, you know, these incentives. Uh, and, um, and, then, and then Congress, right, you're going to have Congress pushing back on this. So I, you know, I think, I think the loan program office, uh, there may be some changes to it, there may be some cuts. And an administration can do things, you know, like that in terms of, of, of programs. Um, but I don't think that it, it's going to be, um, you know, there's going to be any kind of wholesale changes. Um, I think that um, there's just too much at stake. Too many companies in, across the spectrum in energy are, are, are depending on this money to, to, be, to be used. So it's interesting. We've um, kind of surfaced a couple of things that... Dems and Republicans agree on. One is nuclear-ish, within a range, and then um, China and, and dealing with China as a competitor. Since this is, the, this is the true spirit of bipartisanship, what else is in that bucket <laughs> where uh, the parties agree? Uh, is it uh, ethanol or uh, you know, what, what else is in there? Because it's fun to hear things about which people agree. I think, I mean, I think you you sort of covered a lot of the waterfront that there is here. I'll throw out, I, I guess, at least one other item and 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 suggest kind of the 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 fuels space, like the alternative fuels space that, that I think is a space where there is some some real bipartisan uh, interest. Um, you know, something something to watch and and pay attention to. A lot of a lot of Midwestern members, um, and in in both parties with a lot of real interest uh, in that space. Certainly, an evolving space. Um, you know, but but. I think if the last few years tell us anything about all this, and and I, you know, as a tax policy wonk, right? I mean, my my instincts obviously go to sort of the fiscal and the tax space, and and that's a that's a different space than kind of the, the regulatory space that um, Sarah's been talking about. I, I would say we have this, you know, twenty plus year history of a framework of incentives um, for how you know the tax code treats investments in energy and. That dates back to things like um, 
you know, uh, the American Jobs Creation Act of 2004, the Energy Policy Act of 2005, um, you know, and, and in various congressional makeups in that intervening 20 year period, members and administrations of both parties have kind of worked on those policies and tweaked them and adjusted them and, and, and you know, thought about, thought about what made sense. Um, and so there is like, there is a lot of bipartisan history here. And, and it'll be interesting to see in this upcoming Congress, how, you know, how all that dovetails with this, what has been sort of a pretty partisan um, and, and again, widely criticized uh, by Republicans process um, with the with a lot of the incentives in, in the IRA. And, you know, there, there is an, a tendency by some folks, I think, to say an act like, you know, the IRA is like the last word on 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 some of this stuff. And, and if there's one thing I think we can say with some confidence is that it probably will not be the last word that Congress and, and future administrations will revisit this space. Um, you know, and and reassess it and revise it and and work on it moving forward. And 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 so I, I guess all that is to say, I mean, I, I think there is some some history of bipartisan work across the board here. Um, but but certainly no no question a lot rests on what happens in these these elections and they will have consequences. But um yeah, Sarah, what I mean, what would you what would you point to as uh grounds for bipartisan compromise that we haven't we haven't covered here? Uh, I no, I think that's a big one. I'll, I'll take it back to permitting real quick. There is, um, I think, an alignment of interests in a way that there hasn't been previously. So if it doesn't happen this year, the conversation will get picked back up. Um, and and then I guess I would say less less in the legislative space um, because the administration does have a lot of purview over this. But tariffs, um, I think, either administration is going to um, potentially stay the course on some more robust. Uh, uh, implementation in that space. I was just going to go back to something Brett said earlier, and that's about that nuclear is a bipartisan issue. But it's also interesting because we both have worked on the, the working group, the governor's working group in Texas on, on advanced nuclear reactors. Um, a lot of action in the states, in Texas, a lot of you know, developing incentives for nuclear, not just for the reactors themselves, but also the supply chain. Other states are really taking up this, this um, you know, Georgia, Tennessee, Kentucky, Wyoming, several states are, are, are putting programs together trying to attract, Virginia's another one, nuclear activity in the states. And I, I think that a lot of that's come because of the IRA, but a lot of it's come from the trend towards the nuclear that's, that's driven by it being reliable, dispatchable, and zero carbon. Do you think just maybe that's a good kind of place to end? Uh, Sometimes you look at the way states have different approaches and it looks great because it allows, you know, you can try something and you can see if it works and if it does, it's great. If it doesn't, we didn't do it across the whole nation. So sometimes you can make a good case for this experimentation. Other times it looks like states make some bad choices that, that hurt the nation. Do you f feel like either administration is going to be um, more focused on, on national uh, policies as opposed to encouraging states to do their own thing. Like, I know this is a topic about class six permits. So there are various things which states kind of want to take, take it under their own control. Do you, do you see one administration or the other being more of a proponent of states having more control? I think that, that you know, there's a tendency um, in the Republican philosophy to be more focused on states and what they're doing, I mean, and giving more powers to the states. I think that's a traditional view. But I also think that the Democrats have um, really taken what states uh, have done successfully and tried to encourage it to happen in other places. So I think it's, it's a little bit of both. I, I think that, the, but I agree, states are a place where you can try things, you know, that, that may be replicated in other states and may be replicated on a national level. Anything we should have talked about that we didn't, because there's so much in this casserole as we wrap up. Sarah, is there anything we, we should have asked you about or that as you reflect on it, we, it'd be remiss if we didn't mention real quick before we wrap up? Um, this is the first call today where I was not asked where I'll be watching the debate. Uh, this evening and it will oh that's be a great question where are you watching sarah on my couch i appreciate all the lovely invitations but um you know i'm getting up there and i've been in dc for 25 years so my couch is calling <laughs> john anything from you as we wrap up 
Well, I'm, since you ask, I mean, I've only had one opportunity to plug uh, the 2025 tax debate, um, the Super Bowl of taxes, uh, yes. as, as Ways and Means Committee yeah. Chairman Jason Smith uh, has has been calling it. Um, you know, it, not you know, not energy specific in the way this this discussion has been, but will have an enormous impact on the energy industry and, in fact, every American business industry. It's sort of something to um, to think about and focus on looking a little further down the, the pike towards um, towards next year, um, kind of whatever the political environment we're in, um, going to be a, a, an enormous and significant um, policy debate. Oh, that's a great thought. Well, uh, Sarah, John, thank you so much for joining us. This is not an easy conversation because it's complicated and there's all kinds of angles and there's so much we don't know. Jack, thank you for making it possible. And we're really enjoying getting to know everybody at Cornerstone. You guys are doing great work. Great. Well, thank you for the us. opportunity. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much.